have some people joining. I think we'll start in just. We do have quite a number of people who have joined. And I think it would be appropriate to get started. Um, and so uh, my name is Jose Colon and I'm the uh, current president of the Columbia Alumni Association of Dallas-Fort Worth. We're joined tonight uh, by uh, members and uh, affiliates of the uh, Columbia Alumni Association of Dallas-Fort Dallas Worth. I particularly like to acknowledge uh, the Houston and Chicago clubs uh, who have participants uh, and we have registrants from all over. So thank you so much. Uh, we are going to be recording tonight's session uh, for a number of different reasons, uh, not the least of which if someone was inconvenienced and unable to join, uh, they would be able to see the recorded presentation at a later date. And you can also refer back to it for those of you who are joining now uh, and have joined to make reference to uh, key points. Uh, in addition to uh, potentially the sharing of the PowerPoint slides that are going to be presented tonight. Um, and uh, we have uh, the distinct pleasure of, uh, you know, two people joining us uh, for this event tonight. Uh, our uh, Columbia Alumni Association liaison, Paul Lindbergh, who's joining us from New York. And thank you so much for all of your help in coordinating, coordinating this event and affecting communications. And of course, uh, Dr. Stephen Morse. Uh, Dr. Stephen Morse is uh, a professor of epidemiology at Columbia University Mailman School of Public Health and currently the chair of the Columbia University Institutional Biosafety Committee. His research includes uh, learning for emergency effect, uh, emerging, uh, warning for emerging effective uh, infectious diseases and epidemiology and risk assessment of respiratory viruses. And before coming to Columbia, Dr. Morris was uh, assistant professor of virology at the Rockefeller, at Rockefeller University and program manager for biodefense at DARPA. Uh, he's been a chair of uh, the NIH Conference on Drug uh, on Emerging Viruses, uh, for which he originated the concept of emerging viruses slash infections, which was founded, uh, founding chair of the ProMed uh, in the international program to monitor the emerging disease, diseases, best known for the originating outbreak reporting uh, on the internet in 1984. Uh, he does have a book, Emerging Number of Viruses, uh, Oxford University Press in 1993, that was selected by the American scientists of the top 100 science books of the 20th century and currently serves at the World Health Organization Expert Group on Pandemic Influenza Preparedness Planning in the Eastern Mediterranean region. Uh, those just a short sampling of uh, uh, Dr. Morse's credentials and expertise, and we are so grateful for him sharing uh, that wealth of knowledge with us tonight as pertains to coronavirus, past, present, and future, um, as well as an opportunity for us to have Q&A uh, I will ask that if you are not currently muted, that you do so to, during the presentation, the entirety of the presentation, and feel free to unmute yourselves when we indicate that the time has begun for the Q&A session. There are some other uh, housekeeping items that I'd like to uh, ask Paul Lindbergh to, uh, uh, to communicate. Paul? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Jose. And uh, thank you for all your work um, to connect to everyone within the Dallas-Fort Worth community. And I'm really glad to be joining. Um, I actually am currently taking classes at Columbia at SIPA. And Dr. Morse spoke to my class um, around April of last year um, during the height of the pandemic. So it's wonderful to hear from him again uh, at this program. Uh, just as Jose mentioned, we will have the Q&A portion after, his, after Dr. Morris's presentation. Um, if you have any questions during the program, you can add them in the chat menu. And we also have some pre-submitted questions that were pretty in detail, and we really do appreciate people taking the time. Uh, we work with, at the CAA, with over 380,000 Columbia alumni worldwide. Um, and there are over 5,000 Columbia alumni in Texas across the entire state. So we're so glad to welcome uh, Dr. Moore to this program. And 
let let me just pass it over the pass it over to Dr. Morse now. Thank you. Thank thank you very much. It's it's truly a pleasure to be here, and thank you very much, Paul, for uh, the invitation, and thank you, Jose, for the wonderful introduction. I'll try to live up to it, and for the fine Texas welcome. It's always a pleasure to meet with alumni because I'm always impressed by the wonderful alumni network that we have at Columbia. And as I tell my current students at the School of Public Health, one of our great strengths is really the alumni network that they acquire uh, when, they, when they graduate. So I, I think that it offers a lot of opportunities for learning. And I hope this will not repeat everything you've already had. But of course, coronaviruses are very much in our minds these days. Uh, as Jose mentioned, one of my interests for about the last 30 years has been, um, which got me out of the lab, by the way, uh, which was what I was originally trained to do in virology. But then I went into public health simply because I got concerned about the next pandemic and how we might prevent that. That in the days of um, we know flu pandemics and of course HIV, which I think was a very uh, world changing experience, but also changed our point of view about what infectious diseases could do, that in fact, they're not just a relic of the past, but they still exist and they're still very much with us. And uh, that, that's why emerging viruses, which I'll talk about in a moment. So it, I, it is an interesting time as my, one of my former chairs, Ezra Susser used to say, uh, that's a Chinese curse. Any of you who are Chinese or, or are uh, expert in that area can tell me whether that's right or not. But anyway, being in interesting times is um, certainly true for an epidemiologist these days. Back in the days when we used to have uh, dinner parties um, and we were allowed perhaps to be in groups, uh, when you told people you were an epidemiologist, they would sort of look at you in cur with curiosity. And then they would, um, as you began to explain it, you would find more and more space around you, especially if you were infectious diseases. But as you can see, the world has changed in a number of ways and epidemiologists are now somewhat more in fashion as shown years ago by this New Yorker cartoon. This is one of my favorite quotes at the moment uh, from the science fiction writer, Ray Bradbury. Uh, and um, he said, people ask me to predict the future when all I want to do is prevent it. And this is very much what epidemiology is about from my point of view. Part of what we're trying to do is predict and figure out obviously how diseases occur and why, and I'll tell you a great deal more than, um, than that about the coronaviruses specifically, but really what we want to do in public health is to prevent these things. We all know the cliche that prevention is far more effective, the ounce of prevention worth a pound of cure. So we really want to prevent these, these bad things from happening. And so far we really haven't been very successful at that, which is going to be a, an underlying theme in my talk today, but I'll try not to be um, too negative about that. Now, um, as Jose very kindly pointed out, I became interested in emerging viruses and later emerging infections more generally when I was actually toiling away at the lab as a junior faculty member at the Rockefeller University. And uh, our then president, uh, Joshua Lederberg, uh, who won his Nobel Prize, I'm told, for discovering sex and bacteria, that's how the university liked to put it, asked me a question about viruses. And I got very interested in the question of where are these as I call them, emerging viruses uh, coming from. That was back in, in 1987. And we organized a conference at the National Institutes of Health in 1989 to try to answer the, this mystery. Uh, there were various views, rapid evolution, the Andromeda strain from outer space. Um, 
but we would define emerging infections in general as those rapidly increasing in incidence, that means number of new cases or geographic range. And very often we find emerging infections are often novel, a previously unrecognized disease. Uh, think about the one we're experiencing now as a perfect example. I don't have to give you examples because we have one right unfolding right in front of us, unfortunately. Most of these actually, it turns out, and it took us a while uh, to come to this realization, are zoonotic. That is, they're not coming from outer space, but if you will, from inner space, from other species. So they're the natural infections that other species happen to carry the way we have our own infections. And we're just unlucky enough to come in contact with uh, that infection in another species or in the environment sometimes. And ironically, we have met the enemy and very often it is us. Anthropogenic human causes often are really what precipitates emergence. They're unintended consequences of good things like uh, improving agriculture or globalization, all of which we can see the effects of right now with uh, the rapid spread of this pandemic. This is a list of uh, some emerging infections. So you can see there's, there's quite a number of them, including Ebola in 1976, HIV, and of course, a few flu pandemics. Um, I ha happen to be of the right age to have personally experienced 1957, which, which was not, it, it was a rather nasty flu pandemic, and 1968, as well as our much milder one in 2009. But of course, 1918 was the great influence and probably the greatest natural disaster in all of human history responsible for probably about 100 million deaths worldwide and half the world was infected. And that was in the days before we had air travel, but we did have World War I, which probably brought a lot of people together to spread the flu. Now, of course, we can have much, many more opportunities for an infection to be spread if it can gain a foothold. Um, no pandemic or emerging infection has ever been predicted. I said that a few years ago in an article, and unfortunately, it's still true. And we have probably, uh, with confidence, we can say that none has been stopped yet either. Certainly, this one has not yet been stopped, although we, do, we have been trying to slow it down with varying success. And we are hoping eventually to do something like stopping it. So the coronavirus is really a, a classic example of uh, an emerging infection, one that catches us by surprise, but whose actual origin is coming from another species that somehow gets the opportunity to come in contact and share some of its viruses or other microorganisms uh, with the human population. And I'll give you some examples to put the coronaviruses into, contact, into context for you, which is really what I want to do tonight. You're hearing day by day, everything is going around, but um, I, I want to really think about the broader context of these coronaviruses, which have been so famous now and so obscure until recently. So this is an electron micrograph of a coronavirus. And, and basically what you see here is uh, Lord Peter Medawar and his wife June wrote a book uh, called uh, Aristotle to Zoos, a Dictionary of Biology. And it's not all tongue in cheek, but they define a virus as a um, piece of bad news. That's the nu nucleic acid genome, often RNA, oddly enough, unlike all other life forms. Uh, and um, wrapped up, as they said, in proteins. So you can see the viral genome, but it's wrapped up in this protein protective coat or capsid, as we call it in the jargon of the field. Uh, around it, surrounding the uh, bad news and protein is a lipid envelope, very much like a cell membrane. And in fact, the virus gets it when it leaves cells by pushing out through the cell membrane, which it's modified 
in the course of infecting the cell and producing many more copies of itself. And these little uh, studs in here that look like jewels in a crown, corona means crown in Latin, but it, it just so happens that that these little jewels in the crown are what we call the spike protein. And that's a very important uh, part of the coronavirus in terms of determining what cells it can infect, what kinds of species it can infect, because that, among other things, has what we call the receptor binding domain, which allows the virus through its spike protein, a portion of the spike protein, to bind to, the, to its receptor on the cell. In uh, the case of this current coronavirus and one of its uh, precursors, it's the ACE2 angiotensin converting enzyme uh, 2 on the cell surface that this virus attaches to and uses obviously to get into the cell. So these little uh, studs are very important and we'll come back to them later. Before uh, 2003, you would be really hard pressed to find anybody in the um, medical world who really gave much thought to coronaviruses. They had been known since the 30s and identified as causes of veterinary diseases in um, swine, cattle, and even for the lab animal veterinarians, uh, a serious infection, mouse hepatitis virus in mice. And if you're doing experiments, for example, that involve animals, this can be a real problem for the livestock uh, veterinarians, obviously, there were some very serious coronavirus diseases that they'd known about in chickens as well for quite a long time. That was the first one. But it wasn't until the 1960s that a group in the UK stumbled onto uh, some coronaviruses and gave the name coronavirus to, the, to this group of viruses because they thought it looked uh, under the electron microscope solar corona, not the, the jewels in the crown, which is the way I'd interpret it, but the solar corona flare during, during an eclipse or some other event from the sun. Um, and so uh, they had found a couple of things that looked very much like these animal coronaviruses in human uh, tissues. Uh, and uh, a couple of them were described in the 60s, some later, but they were of no real interest in human virology because they found them in children with things like the common cold or a flu-like illness. And we later learned that they circulate around uh, ubiquitously as the cause of something like the common cold or a flu-like illness during the flu season. So there really wasn't much interest in coronaviruses because they seemed to be not very serious, just another cause of the cold, um, which people studied, but usually as a sideline until 2003, when SARS, severe acute respiratory syndrome came along and completely changed the landscape for us. So the major event that brought SARS to world attention was a mass a spreading event in a hotel in Hong Kong called the Metropole. They changed the name after that, of course. Hotel in Hong Kong, where an individual, uh, a doctor in fact, from the uh, South China on the mainland in Guangdong uh, came to Hong Kong for a family event uh, I think it was a wedding, and stayed at this hotel. He uh, got sick with this respiratory infection, essentially pneumonia, and uh, for reasons not fully understood even today, a number of people staying in the hotel at the same time, sort of like the famous Diamond Princess cruise ship, um, also contracted the infection. Some of them didn't get sick and show symptoms until later, I'll come back to that in a moment and show you more about that. Others became sick um, fairly soon uh, within uh, the time they were staying at the hotel in Hong Kong. Now, this was not actually the first that the world had been uh, alerted to the existence of this infection. 
ProMed Mail, the program for monitoring emerging diseases, which we started as a way of improving early warning systems around the world in the early 1990s, actually um, was um, an email listserv. In the early days, this was a very painful experience, I may add. But in 2003, in early Feb 10th of February, about a week before this event in Hong Kong, this posting appeared on ProMed Mail, which goes, as you'll see in a moment, uh, all over the world for those who want to read it, uh, asking about some strange epidemic in South China that um, from the headline suggested was uh, a pneumonia of some kind without going into detail, simply asking, does anyone know anything about this? Uh, let me back up a moment then and just, just give a, a, a little um, history of ProMed, uh, because perhaps I take a kind of paternal pride, if you will. Uh, when we started this, there was no real outbreak reporting system or system for early warning. And the technology was much more primitive, believe it or not. Those of you who are of a certain age will know what I mean. Um, and an email was a very painful thing to do. But um, since we had members all over the world, uh, various laboratories, public health um, authorities, and scientists all over the world, about 60 places uh, throughout the world, we had no way for them to communicate. And so in fact, Josh Lederberg, an early adopter of all technologies, suggested we might try email, which was equally painful for everyone at the time. So we put everyone on email, which was actually no mean feat. Most people didn't want to use it, and I understand why. Uh, now, of course, we, we shy away from it for different reasons. Um, but we started this as a moderated listserv, meaning that subject matter experts would be looking at what came in and would then post it to all subscribers. It's still available today. Anyone can get it. No advertising. They don't sell the mailing list. No government support from any government or any commercial entity. The whole idea was to make it free and unbiased. It started in 1994 and it has approximately 70,000 subscribers in over 185 countries around the world. One author called it the most terrifying news source known to man. Uh, that may have been true in 2006. It may be different now. The world is a more complex place. However, um, whoever read that uh, query on ProMed Mail uh, was not sufficiently prepared when cases started coming into the hospital, first in Hong Kong, and as you'll see in a moment later elsewhere, with this unexplained, uh, what was called community acquired pneumonia, a, a severe pneumonia that had no obvious explanation. And the first patient or index case, as we like to call it in the jargon of epidemiology, was this physician from South China, he had treated a patient with the same complaint. So he thought when he came down with this, uh, with this disease, this pneumonia, that this must be something transmissible. This is what he told his healthcare providers, but unfortunately they um, probably didn't listen as carefully as they should have. My apologies to the clinicians in the audience because um, 99 healthcare providers and close contacts became infected from this patient and from two others who uh, got it in that hotel and um, got symptoms, became sick and went to the hospital while they, they were in Hong Kong. Others went on with their business and then got sick at their destinations in Vietnam, Singapore, the US in one case, Ireland, and of course, very famously, Toronto, Canada, where, they, where there was a large secondary outbreak within the hospital setting. And with a few exceptions, almost all of the transmission of SARS, severe acute respiratory syndrome, was essentially through the healthcare associated 
setting. So it was through lapses, as we might say, in infection control, which is really hard to do very rigorously as you have to, uh, if you wanna be perfect, but it's really a lot of work to do that. And any slip up here doing, during certain procedures that make you very close to the patient and generate what we call an aerosol, like putting in a, a breathing tube and similar things, can uh, lead to a risk of an infection. And that's where most of the infections occurred after the initial outbreak. Well, so it, it, that was the big bang event of SARS. And the question of course was, where did it come from? It was recognized as a coronavirus fairly rapidly, essentially through that uh, taking a picture similar to the one I showed you uh, earlier under the electron microscope. And then there was an attempt to trace back its origin and a number of different environments and other animals were sampled. And it turns out that the natural host, the real source of this infection that carries it just as a, a cold as we carry our coronaviruses and excretes it with minimal symptoms for prolonged periods of time, we think, is this little bat, the horseshoe bat, an insect eating bat that can be found in much of Asia and many other places nearby and is sold in the live animal markets in South China. And that's probably how it got to the human population through the live animal markets, either through another species that was there or directly to humans, we're not sure. But um, in any case, uh, that is how SARS entered the world. And interestingly enough, when it first appeared, there was a lot of interest about, you know, could there be others out there? And a lot of sampling was done of these bats and related both in live animal markets, like the one in, in Guangdong and south, uh, other parts of South China where you could find cases and also find the virus in bats and the um, live animal markets, but also about a dozen other closely related SARS-like viruses could be found in, in these and related bats. So we knew that really we should have known that there are a lot of others just waiting for an opportunity. But then it was controlled largely through good healthcare uh, infection control measures and we more or less forgot about it until 10 years later when another SARS-like infection turned up, we call in the Middle East, we call that Middle East Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus Disease. It first appeared in 2012 and was also reported on ProMed Mail. Uh, about half of the people who went into the hospitals uh, with um, some essentially pneumonia, very much like SARS, um, about half of them had uh, contact with camels. And we know there are similar coronaviruses in camels. As it turns out, I had a PhD student who did his PhD on this and now works for CDC. Um, it, about half of the primary cases, the people who come into the hospital with with uh, an infection and with symptoms have no known camel exposure. So there are still some mysteries when you can trace it back to the camel. Like SARS, it's also largely transmitted through the healthcare associated setting and it caused large spikes, largely when infected people who showed symptoms went to the hospital and as in the case of SARS, uh, healthcare workers and other people in the healthcare setting became infected. And you can see the spikes here. This just is a, what we call an epi or epidemiologic curve showing the number of cases plotted um, as a function of time. Uh, and most of them were in the Gulf region, the Persian Gulf or Arabian Peninsula, depending on your geopolitical frame. Uh, someone from SEPA would, would know this, I suspect, um, I, I'm sure. But also in 1985, someone traveling in that uh, area, a business person from Korea, Korean business person who um, did business extensively in that area on one of many trips apparently contracted this infection, was incubating it on his way home. And when he got home to Korea, uh, came down with the uh, classic 
classical pneumonia-like symptoms and started off all hospital and healthcare associated cases in a number of different hospitals, uh, 185 infections with 36 deaths. At our last count, there have been over 2,500 infections with about almost 900 deaths. Um, SARS was about a 10% case fatality ratio. This is about uh, close to 35%. So this is something that e e SARS is not nice, but this is something you also want to avoid getting. Um, it's gone down mostly because of better infection control measures. And then we forgot about that, even though it's still ongoing and we're still working on improving that. But we pretty much put the coronaviruses in the back of our minds until last year. And then suddenly another coronavirus, which we now officially call SARS coronavirus 2, because of COVID coronavirus disease uh, 2019, as the WHO dubbed it. So this is the virus. It's a coronavirus related to SARS, but it's not SARS. This is the disease when people show signs and symptoms of disease. And I'm going to make that distinction for a reason I'll show you in a minute, but this is often a pneumonia, but as, you've, as you know by reading the papers, could be many other things, including in severe cases, a multi-organ failure, which we also saw in hospitalized MERS patients. So it's very similar in its clinical aspects and shouldn't have been a great surprise. It was first announced by the World Health Organization in early January as having started uh, known, or at least China uh, told them that, that it started on the 31st of December of 2019 when they first uh, identified cases that went back to earlier in January um, and they informed the WHO. Interestingly enough, ProMed the day before had put a notice up um, about um, a report on, on this undiagnosed pneumonia in China, like the original SARS, but making no, we didn't, nobody knew what it was. They just knew it was a pneumonia. And the WHO Geneva headquarters actually found out about it and asked the China office to follow up on it by reading this postings. So I'm glad to see that um, people do sometimes read it and sometimes it helps. So they announced it to the world and then went to China because there's a very odd um, situation. It wasn't clear how it was transmitted. China thought that it was not transmitted in the healthcare setting, which was how the other coronaviruses we had worried about, SARS and MERS, were mostly transmitted, but they didn't think there was person-to-person -person transmission. So something didn't make sense because it had to be transmitted somehow. And as I'll show you in a minute, there were a lot of cases very quickly. So WHO actually made a visit in early, in, in third week of January, and by the 22nd of January, they could clearly say that this was known to be a coronavirus, they, they actually had some diagnostic kits that China had developed to test locally. And it appeared to be uh, that there was human to human transmission. That's what this report says. So we already knew that and we had other re reasons to think that. This is a timeline and I won't go in, into it in detail except to say that it continued to evolve there in China. They blamed, uh, a, a local live animal market, the seafood market, which may have been one source of infection, still not clear if that was the original or only source. Um, and of course, uh, the first death record in January 11th, the WHO reports about its human to human transmission and our first case in the US on the 20th of January. 30th of January of last year, 2020, a global public health emergency, a public health emergency of international concern, as we call it, was declared and the, uh, the uh, US closed uh, travel from and to China. So uh, people within 
uh, who had been to China within the past two weeks were uh, barred if they were not American citizens or American nationals from entering the US. Now, um, unlike the SARS and MERS coronaviruses, we know that this coronavirus is highly transmissible by the respiratory route. Like the flu, although there are other ways that it can leave the body, including like many coronaviruses through the intestines. And this shouldn't been, have been a surprise because we have all these human circulating coronaviruses that do exactly that. They're very efficient at spreading by the respiratory route and entering essentially through the, the nose, the mouth, or the eyes. So that's classical, but you know, basically we hadn't solved this problem with flu. Um, as of February 28th, 2020, a little more than a year ago, there, were, uh, there was a large cluster of cases in China. So they had to take very serious, really draconian actions to keep it under control, which they did, but only a few cases, cases defined as people with obvious illness who needed to, see, to seek medical attention, you know, like pneumonia or whatever, uh, or difficulty breathing, in other places. And so it seemed like a tale of two countries. Essentially, you had uh, China where, where it was going up very rapidly, and then the West where there were a few cases, but uh, nothing much was happening. And then suddenly everything reversed. China, through a lot of really harsh, severe measures got it under control. They had to because it, it had already gone so far I think we should have learned from that 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 would not have been the best response. But by March, by mid-March, the West was now exceeding, everywhere outside of China was now exceeding by far the number of cases that existed in China. And one mistake we made early on was to think about symptomatic cases. So we were screening people at the airports, not using a diagnostic test or some kind of screening test for the virus, but looking for things like a fever and, and other signs of illness. We now know that in fact, this is a flu by the way, so it's even truer with this, but it happens even with the flu where we think there are always symptoms, not true. So it turns out that the vast majority of cases are mild or inapparent, but still producing virus. They become infected, they can walk around without any apparent ill effects. And of course, they're one of the major means both numerically and because they don't know that, that they have to be cautious of transmission. We were concentrating on this top part, the severely, uh, in fact, affected cases and those who were sick enough to require medical attention. Um, by February, it was very clear actually that we should have known that there were many different possibilities of uh, respiratory transmission because we had many examples, which I won't go into, showing that in fact in Asia, uh, it was happening. And, the, and China had already reported it. There had been some other reports, but for some reason in the West, it just was not taken seriously. So um, when we realized what was happening, we ended up, since there was no vaccine, essentially using uh, early 20th century methods to try to control the first major pandemic of the 21st century. So this was the flu in 1918, people wearing masks, and, and they were very annoyed about it too. And this is the 20 cent, uh, this is the high tech 21st century version. And those familiar precautions for reducing transmission are based essentially on what we know about how this virus transmits, much like the flu, but with some exceptions, somewhat better than the flu. So they're designed essentially to cut down transmission of the virus as much as possible. And they've been largely successful when they've been practiced. Unfortunately, the, all of everything about this pandemic has become highly politicized for reasons I won't comment on, but it's very unfortunate. You, you know, you, you can listen on, on radio or television to Governor Abbott on the one hand, and um, Peter Hotez um, 
uh, on the other, a physician, you know, and get completely opposite ideas because we have had very contradictory messaging. And it's largely been based on, unfortunately, more on political views than on, on science. The science continues to evolve. We only realized a little bit later in the game in April that we really should officially, CDC then officially did advise people to wear masks, that it really does make a difference. But the other things like distancing, hand hygiene, so you don't accidentally touch some susceptible part like your nose, mouth, or eyes with something that could be contaminated with virus and accidentally infect yourself. All of those good ventilation, staying outdoors as much as possible and avoiding crowds indoors, all of those are still true. So the situation as of today, in terms of the number of infections, you can see it's now spread all around the world, which is why we call it a pandemic. Pan from the Greek all, essentially an epidemic that has spread um, to many different parts, uh, essentially covering the whole world geographically. And, and we've seen that. A few countries in Asia, particularly such as um, Taiwan, very quickly, Singapore, South Korea, Vietnam, uh, for quite a while, Thailand as well, and a number of other countries took this very seriously and were able to control it early on. And despite some glitches, when cases, when individuals came back, with an infection and weren't detected, these places have generally kept it very well under control, unlike uh, Europe and the Western hemisphere, uh, in part because we were very slow in reacting as we should have and screening for not cases, but infected individuals where the spread was really mostly occurring because they're the most numerous. This is the current uh, number of cases from uh, CDC. And what you can see, these are actual illnesses and people who are tested positive, which varies a little over time and with place. But you can see there have been a number of surges. New York had, had one right around here. Um, and many of them follow things like major holidays. No surprise, people gather, as you saw on spring break, in large numbers, often with few precautions, and then they go back home and uh, you know, take it with them. Uh, however, we've had the very fortunate situation recently that, a vac that vaccines have been developed, and we've been very lucky in this respect, because it's really quite a remarkable feat to be able to develop a usable vaccine in less than a year. And in fact, um, with the coronaviruses generally, most of the animal coronaviruses don't have very good vaccines. So this is really, you know, um, almost miraculous. And it, it's, it's really a, a tour de force of modern technology, although unfortunately it was necessary. And um, I'll come back to that later. This is a cartoon of the same thing you saw earlier. These are the spike proteins looking like spikes. This is the bad news, the genome, uh, one piece of single piece of RNA. Uh, um, uh, genome. The rest of us have DNA genomes, but many viruses have RNA genomes in various formations. Other viruses have DNA, like the herpes viruses. So they've tried out every variation on, on you know, how to express themselves, if you will. But this is the major target because it's an important, um, uh, important protein for a function for the way the virus works. And so three different technologies have actually been tried out now to make, um, to make vaccines. All of them have been successful. If you've had the or heard about the Pfizer or Moderna vaccines, Pfizer, BioNT, um, or Moderna vaccines, those are based on actually a, an RNA copy of the spike gene of the uh, virus that you then get it's wrapped up in a certain way so your body will recognize it and you get that as an injection. And that's a very advanced technology. It's been under development for well over a decade, um, but probably longer, but there hasn't been a commercial incentive. So nobody really wanted to 
uh, manufacture anything like this because um, there's no real benefit for a company in taking the risk to make a new vaccine if there's already an existing vaccine that's good enough because it, 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 it's a big risk to try to develop new vaccines. So this has been, as you know, a resounding success. Another method that was tried was simply to purify the protein or, or express the protein uh, in essentially biotechnologically, purify it, and then wrap it up in something to help the body uh, recognize it as, as foreign, and then uh, inject that. That's the basis for uh, some vaccines being tested right now. I thought this would be one of the earliest ones because this is a pretty well understood technology, but Novavax, which is making one, is just getting off the ground and I think we'll soon be able to distribute it. And then there are others that, that use another, we would think harmless virus to carry the spike gene and express it in the body. And many of the other uh, vaccines uh, for example, the AstraZeneca, the Johnson & Johnson are using this strategy. These two are both very high, uh, highly sophisticated strategies. This has been used. This one really uh, came into being and quickly because of the real need that developed. So now we have a number of candidates. You've heard about the Pfizer BioNTech, the Moderna, the Johnson & Johnson uh, Janssen vaccine. Janssen is there. Uh, the company they own that developed it, AstraZeneca, which isn't, you know, has, has had its ups and downs, but I hope will eventually get straightened out. These three have been approved for use, and they are remarkably effective and remarkably safe uh, compared with uh, contracting the disease for someone my age, I'm 69, I'd much rather have the vaccine. And indeed, thanks to Columbia, I was fortunate enough to get two doses, as was my wife, uh, through New York State of the Pfizer BioNTech. So they're very effective, but we also worry about variants. As the virus um, moves through the human population as it grows and replicates, that is makes more copies of itself, errors occur. And these errors or mutations in the viral genome may be expressed in a, an altered protein, like an altered spike protein, which may give it different properties. The one we've seen most often with these variants is the ability to spread much more readily. So the original virus was displaced by a mutant very quickly within a few months, which became the predominant mutant worldwide. It became the building block for almost all of the other variants, including the famous UK, uh, the variant identified in the UK, B117, which we worry about because it's really taken off in many other countries. And, and that has been built on, on this mutation with some other mutations added that made it more effective in transmitting. And of course it ran the race. It was able to displace its competitors because it could outrun them. And as you can see, it's now uh, quite common throughout the United States, including Texas. Um, and others as well, some of the others that had been described in other places. So there are lots of variants that occur as the virus um, replicates, as it reproduces itself, and it's not nearly as mutable as, say, the flu, about half as much, but it's also about twice as transmissible as flu. So uh, we want to prevent people from, um, from getting infected and from infecting others, because the more of virus we have going around, the greater the chance of new variants evolving. And at some point we worry that there might be one that is no longer able to be stopped by the vaccines. The ones we have now are very good, better than we would have ever imagined. Even the ones that we you know, turn our noses up at, all I can say is they're better than most vaccines on the market in terms of uh, efficacy. And in safety, they're quite comparable, although they're a little different in terms of you know, what the side effects are. They're quite safe as well, uh, given the number that have been given out. So if I had a choice and could get a vaccine now, I'd take it, whichever one I got. It, I wouldn't even wait to ask, you know, I want a better one. They're all good and they'll all keep you out of the hospital. 
But as the virus spreads, we may see new variants that could be more dangerous or evade the vaccine. So that worries us a lot. So the question I want to end with is, what is the future of SARS coronavirus 2? I think in the long uh, term, it may eventually become domesticated, like those human uh, coronaviruses I talked about earlier, the four that we know about, and the others that had been stumbled upon and described but never really followed up on. So I suspect there are a number of others circulating fairly silently in the human population. But uh, this may be how they got started. We know that one of them uh, OC43, which is one of the commonest and uh, very mild in general, in most cases, some people can get very sick, probably came into humans from cows because it's very closely related to the bovine cow uh, coronaviruses, very closely related. And, and it, there seems to be a historical record suggesting it might have been as recently as the 19th century. So we don't know because nobody was there to record it, but we may be seeing the early stages, uh, very frightening, but the early stages of adopting a new coronavirus if we can't completely control it. Another possibility is that it might become more like the seasonal flu, gaining mutations, becoming, uh, b getting different variants and reinfecting from time to time requiring boosters. This is a possibility in the short term if we don't succeed in completely controlling and eliminating it. And I don't think that's really going to be likely because that means we have to protect the entire world. So with that, I'll thank you for your time and interest and take some questions in the time remaining. I appreciate your giving me more than my share of, of the time uh, today. And thank you for your time and attention. Thank you, Dr. Morris. Uh, we were very grateful for all the valuable information that you've shared with us tonight. Uh, I do now invite uh, our participants uh, to unmute themselves and ask questions or utilize the chat, which we are also monitoring uh, in order to pose questions. Um, so please uh, take advantage of this great opportunity to uh, ask Thank a you. foremost authority on, on this topic. Dr. Morris, uh, do you care to comment on the WHO visit to Wuhan and their decision to, I guess, not make a declaration as to how the virus started? Yeah, well, I, I think, you know, I, I didn't think it was a very good idea in the first place at this time, quite frankly. I mean, I think at some point, this is something we need to know, but there are very raw nerves on every side, you know, for a number of reasons. China got blamed very heavily for holding actually for about three months, not owning up to the original SARS. And they obviously got a lot of criticism for perhaps not being candid as, as we would have liked here. But it's become such a politicized issue on all sides that I think this was not the time personally to do it. I knew about half the people personally who went on that trip. I think that you know there were political pressures, but I didn't think they would come up with an answer because you know nobody really wants to. People had and I some people had an idea about what they expected to find. Other people, obviously, most of us thought it was likely to be natural. But you know, we thought the real task was to try to control this, get this behind us, let tempers cool a little bit, and then you know, do some scientific investigation. So that's my feeling. It was inconclusive because I think you know it was just obviously perceived as as not being a friendly visit. China had a lot to be embarrassed about. And I think everyone, it, it was a very highly charged atmosphere. We need to wait a few years before doing this. And nobody uh, wants the pangolin, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, you know, I think that most of us think that, you know, in the absence of better evidence, the natural source, since that seems to be the history of what the ones we know about, probably bats and some other species perhaps being involved, but we don't have the clear smoking gun, if you will, or smoking bat. 
the way we did in the others. So, you know, it's still an open question and we just need evidence. And this is just not the time to do it. This is the time to get to work on vaccinating and getting it out to the world and controlling it. That's my personal opinion. Thank you. So I told them, you know, when they asked me, I told them, please, you know, if anyone, when WHO, uh, you know, I, I thought this would be a very bad time, a very bad idea. Uh, and I think it hasn't made anyone very happy. You know, some people are satisfied with the answer and many people are not, so. Dr. Morris, we have another question that's come up in the chat. Okay. Um, it says, are we looking at a race between new variants and vaccine rate to prevent another surge? I think that's, that's true. I think that's exactly right. We are worried because we don't know what new variants may come out, but you know, certainly they will be driven by host immunity. So they're ones that are basically able to transmit well right now, but some of them may, may be ones that, that are able to escape the natural immunity. The vaccine has been doing much better but we think it's a matter of time. If we're buying time, the virus may get new variants if we can't slow it down or stop it in time. So it is a race. And that's why we're also, uh, despite what others may say, you know, in, there's been a lot of misinformation and disinformation and confusion. But most of us, I think on, on this side of, you know, the, in, in the, on the scientific side feel that yeah, you know, we, we are still learning, but we need to do everything we can. That includes the mask, the distancing, all those precautions to keep the spread of the virus down so that we don't let this spread to the point that a new variant pops up in South Africa, as one did, where it was seen, or Brazil, as another worrisome one was. The vaccines seem to cover them well enough, we think in the real world, but not perfectly, but it will keep you out of the hospital. So we know the danger is there that the vaccines could be rendered obsolete if we don't slow down the spread of the virus. So it's important to keep up those precautions, boring as they may seem. And I don't enjoy them much either, even though, you know, um, e even though I'm, I'm now fully vaccinated, you know, I consider it a safety measure. I don't know what's out there. So I'm still taking the other precautions and it's essential if we want to keep this from, you know, getting new, evolving new tricks. So Dr. Morris, just to expand on that uh, last couple of statements that you said, uh, I, I've heard it stated and actually seen it written that the initial priority for uh, the first vaccine production was with a focus on reducing mortality, um, that eventually there would be an attention turned to preventing contracting the uh, the virus in the first place. Can you expand on that? Yeah, that's been almost too good to be true. I mean, the, the vaccine story has been a remarkable success. And, uh, you know, whether, um, however it came about, you know, different people have different stories, but, you know, the, the warp speed doesn't mean that it was not done carefully and with all the, the normal clinical trials, in fact, clinical trials with 30 or 40,000 people for the Pfizer, over 30 and 40,000 people respectively for the Pfizer and Moderna uh, trials. But what you usually look for in a clinical trial is something you can spot that you're concerned about as a clinical outcome. So that means keeping people out of the hospital, preventing noticeable or severe disease. That was the thing they were looking for immediately because actually testing for the virus is a more expensive and labor intensive operation. You've got to get the timing right. So it's easy, easier to tell if a vaccine prevents people from getting sick. And all of these vaccines have been remarkably good at that. Almost beyond, not all vaccines prevent the initial infection or even prevent transmission. And uh, almost unbelievably, you know, I think, and really uh, miraculously, um, the, the vaccines we've had so far, it's clear from some recent evidence and healthcare workers put out by the CDC and from work in Israel and other places that the Pfizer BioNTech and the Moderna vaccines very likely seem to very clearly prevent uh, transmission, even in asymptomatic individuals. So uh, that may give us an extra help in slowing down the virus when more 
people, when enough people get vaccinated, that promised land of herd immunity where the virus can find new people to infect very easily because there are simply so few of them. Um, but it's gonna be a while before the world gets to that stage. But the, uh, the vaccine story has been a remarkable one and one that exceeded all of our expectations, including the fact that at least some of them are now known to be able to reduce transmission and primary infection. And all of them will keep you out of the hospital, even with some of these variants. So thank you for asking. It's something we had not anticipated or took for granted in the beginning. We do have other questions in the chat. Uh, one uh, additional question here is when we might know if a booster vaccine is needed, might a booster be needed if uh, no serious variants develop? I know one question that comes up is, you know, why do we only say three months or four months uh, after vaccination, you, know, you can consider yourself protected for that long? And the answer is the vaccine probably is effective much longer, even natural immunity from uh, getting infected and recovering may be good for much longer, but the, uh, we haven't had enough time to test that. What we know so far from you know, having um, had people who have had the vaccine since January uh, and December in some cases is, is that we are seeing a, a longer effect. So it probably is going to be good, but we, you know, for much, much more than a few months, but we don't know how long. We also don't know what new variants may come along. And so there is a lot of work by all the vaccine companies to develop uh, modifications that, that may take into account variants that we, are, that we have now or that we are expecting might, might pop up in the future in case we do need a booster. So far, we've, we've, it's really been working better than we could have imagined, but we mustn't get complacent. I see there also a lot of misunderstanding about these vaccines. Um, the, the vaccine um, is um, from Pfizer and Moderna are messenger RNAs. And our body actually uses the same um, mechanism to code for proteins. That is, you know, and that's what this is doing. Essentially, it's making the body, just as a virus is doing with its own genome, it's making the body make copies of the spike protein of the virus, uh, but then also using its own machinery and the cells that take up the vaccine, but also Obviously, it's seen as being foreign because of the way it's wrapped up and picked up by cells that process these uh, foreign antigens, as we call them, these foreign substances, and that stimulates an immune response. Now, messenger RNA in general is pretty fragile. So in the body, it doesn't last very long. And in under natural circumstances, it doesn't stay around that long. The Pfizer and mRNA and, and Moderna vaccines don't replicate, that is they don't, they make copies, they make copies of the protein, but they don't make extra copies of themselves. It's a one shot deal basically. So um, at that point you'd expect the messenger RNA, which is pretty fragile to degrade. When we work with these things in the lab, we have to be very careful that we don't accidentally degrade it. Um, so we think that the long-term, you know, staying in the body, uh, we, we have, obviously we need more evidence, but we think that's very unlikely. And what we know about the way these act and the way messenger RNA acts, I think it's very unlikely to stay in the body more than, than just uh, transiently. Thank you. We've had a participant with his hand up virtually for some time, Collins okay. Mokuru. Collins, would you like to unmute yourself and ask? Your question? Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Colin. And uh, Dr. Morris, I remember hearing you speak in August at the uh, COVID, uh, COVID course. Oh. It's kind of interesting to see your talk and uh, kind of compare it to now where we have the vaccine rolling out. Um, it's different. Guess, yeah, for sure. <laughs> Definitely different yeah. scenario. Yeah. Um, I guess I hit you with a two-parter. Um, okay. I know you mentioned with uh, our kind of race against the variants. Um, recently, I think this week, uh, Kenya went into a second lockdown because uh, I think positivity rates were above the tens of percentage. Yeah. I think some I heard one report 50% positivity rate, and I know the testing is not being done well. I'm kind of curious to know um, what people, like in, on your radar, kind of the uh, infectious disease radar, 
how people are thinking about these regions where testing is not as prevalent and spread is very common given lifestyle and given kind of, you know, um, the way the economy yeah. is set up and, and the, the likelihood of, of, of um, people being able to social distance and things like that. That's an excellent question. And I think nothing makes it clearer than a pandemic. And unfortunately, you know, somehow politics got involved in this and I won't comment on that, but nothing makes it clearer than a, globally, nothing makes it clearer than a pandemic that we're all in this together and that every country needs to pool its resources because, you know, it's not a cliche, even though you hear it a lot, you know, as they say, no place is, is, is safe until every place is safe. So we really have to do everything. If we have resources, we have to do everything we can to make the rest of the world World and help the rest of the world to be free of this. Um, some efforts are being made there, but I think we should be doing more. Unfortunately, the way this evolved politically, not just in the United States, but globally in many countries, totally baffles me. It was essentially every country was doing their own thing and there was no real global coordination. If there had been, I think we could have stopped this sooner and done this much more efficiently, but it behooves us now to make sure that there's access for everyone. Now, um, I happen to think that we do need more what we would call genomic or genetic surveillance. And again, you know, the UK is the only country that maybe others have, but they were famous for doing 10% of their uh, virus positive samples and actually looking for mutations and things in them. And that's how they found the one that's now associated with the UK. It probably started there, but it may, it may have actually started somewhere else and just taken off there where it got noticed. So a lot of these things exist. You have a California variant in Southern California, which is right now being, I think, outrun by the B117 UK variant. But we don't know what's there because we're not doing systematic surveillance. So I think that's the first thing. And I think the world has to pull its resources. I think we have to make sure to engage the communities because you know there's a lot of mistrust. And the only way I think you can get people's trust is by uh, talking to trusted leaders in the community and getting them to talk honestly to their, the people in their communities. Um, and that can be a variety of people, you know, not just, not just uh, healthcare personnel, but community leaders in various ways, uh, religious leaders, you know, and so on. They're very important. People listen to them. And, you know, if they're given the information, hopefully, you know, um, are able to, you know, recognize the seriousness of the problem, they can help people. Basically, you know, what we're doing is trying to help ourselves by these measures to slow down the virus. But I think that this virus nationalism, as people, or this um, vaccine nationalism, as people sometimes call it, is very mistaken. Uh, it's, uh, you know, basically cutting off your nose to spite your face. It's very short Decided because in the end, if we're going to succeed, and that's why I'm less optimistic, perhaps more optimistic now that we have a vaccine. But still, you know, in the long run, I think it um, uh, we may not be able to completely get rid of this virus simply because there's a lot of it around, and there are a lot of places that still need a lot of attention. And then there are some places, your neighbor Tanzania, uh, you know, where the leadership was not. Uh, Strangely enough, South Africa was, was with the program, although having had some, some past issues with HIV, that's something else. Um, you know, but in Tanzania, as you know, and the president just died, I'm sorry to say, but he obviously did not believe that this thing was real. A lot of people believe that it isn't real until you see somebody who has had it or someone's relative who dies of it. You know, but um, they didn't try to control it there for that reason. And the borders, of course, are very hard to control in many countries. We saw that in uh, Ebola in 2014. So I think that you know, what we're doing is, is getting, is the right thing, but we're getting off to a slow start and the rest of the world has to get the same thing. So I don't know how you think we could do that because I, I, I've seen that you know, right now, uh, it's, it's been the wealthy who, who are getting it. And we we're just hoping the supply is large enough so that you know, we'll be able to give it to others. I think there's a willingness now which wasn't there before. But I'd be interested in your comments. 
Um, I guess, yeah, thank you for your response. I, I think for me, the, um, the one thing that I would have liked to see was the kind of that prioritization when the discussion about uh, vaccine rollout was coming into yeah. play. If we had a global kind of perspective of understanding of where to prioritize this, this kind of um, rollout, because I think for me, like you mentioned, testing is kind of the more difficult way of kind of following up uh, on COVID or something like this is spreading so quickly. So if we could prevent it and kind of prioritize in regions where these measures or these recommendations that we would need to put in place, like social distancing, access to masks, yeah. um, shutting down of economies, where those would hit hardest, kind of prioritizing those first um, as the regions of vaccination. But again, like you mentioned, um, yeah. national national interests kind of come first and the politicization of, of that kind of also got in the way. So, so we hope that, you know, sense will prevail as the resources, you know, as more vaccine get, gets produced. But, you know, it was really miraculous because we we're waiting for a vaccine to save us. If we had started more effective surveillance as Taiwan did, as Korea did much earlier on, um, or if we had started these non-pharmaceutical measures and taken them seriously, everyone much earlier on, you know, we could have prevented a lot of what we're going through now, including, I argue, although there's obviously no way to prove that counterfactual, as we call it in epidemiology, um, I argue the lockdowns could have been largely avoided too. That was a last resort. And it should never have been necessary if we had done the other things right. But that's my biased point of view, I'll admit that. But I think we have other examples show, you know, we know how it could have been done better if we'd, uh, the world had dedicated itself and the wealthier countries. Uh, there's one other thing I'd also like to bring up because I see a question in the chat box. If you'll forgive me for taking the time, Jose, Not at uh, all. from your session. Um, there are a lot of questions about the vaccine. So um, none of them uh, can alter your genetic material. They, they don't, um, the, the mRNAs, are, as far as we know, yes, they're more stable than mRNAs that we isolate without anything around them in the laboratory, but they're not very stable. So, um, you know, there's not much danger that they're gonna hang around in our bodies for a long time because our bodies get rid of our own messenger RNA that we use transiently to code for a protein. And when we no longer need it, you know, essentially we have a system for dismantling it. So we can now, um, now make new RNAs for, for new proteins we need. And that works pretty quickly, that system. So, you know, I, I, I think that's, that's something we hear about, but I don't think it's you know, until we have real evidence, I, I don't see that as a likely concern. Um, the FDA approval has often come up because it seems to have been so quick. But I will tell you, I, I read the data that the FDA provided, that the companies provided, and I have a number of friends on the two advisory committees, including the FDA advisory committee. Some of you may, may know uh, some of them, like Paul Offit, that looked over carefully. And, and although the trials were telescoped so that they wouldn't have to do them all sequentially and thereby save time, they were very big um, clinical trials. The data were, although unfortunately first announced by press release, the data were actually very good um, and better than anyone had expected. And in terms of the side effects, yes, there have been some th things we've heard about. I was bracing myself for the worst when I got my second Pfizer vaccine. And, and frankly, I, I don't know whether it worked, but you know, many people tell me anecdotally, that's not data, you know, that they didn't feel much of an effect. Um, so we do hear about the bad things that happen. But from my point of view, you know, with my risk factors being an older male, um, I would not, I would much rather have had the vaccine with all the known and very, very rare. Uh, uh, more serious side effects, but they're very rare. We now know. I would rather have taken my chance, have taken the vaccine, than take my chances with the infection, because you know that could kill me. Even if it only kills one percent, the vaccine is is you know a thousand, ten thousand times, maybe a hundred thousand times safer. Uh, and the side effects compared with the with 
disease itself are, are very small, but there was a lot of proper testing done on it. There was a lot of thought put into it. Um, there wasn't time for the FDA to go through the, and for the companies to want to go through the full procedure because that would have involved a lot of time that I think everyone felt you know, really needed to be spent on getting the vaccines out and giving it to people. But these have been tested. I do expect at some point they will be um, put through the normal FDA procedure because we probably will be giving them out for some time to come. And I think that's really important because you know people think it was so quick, but it was done very carefully. It was not rushed. Uh, I was skeptical at first, um, not, not hesitant, skeptical. I wanted to see the data. Once I saw the data, and of course, after I saw people who had gotten it and took it myself, you know, I, I feel um, that we hear about bad things, but those are really, you know, the really bad effects are really very, very rare. Even with the AstraZeneca, although we still have to sort that one out, I, I think, you know, we, um, it's probably um, not an accurate reflection. But um, I do admit my bias. I, I do think we should be taking the vaccine if we can get it. Uh, I think it's far better than taking chances with the infection. Even young people die from this, and children can get these, these circulatory uh, problems, abnormalities that are rare, but they occur. And the vaccine seems a lot safer in our experience, even than that. So let me just, you know, give that little lecture because I'm asked it a lot. And uh, I, I admit, you know, I, I think we needed the vaccine, but I also think that this is a lot better than we had any right to expect, um, you know, g given the lackadaisical attitude right up till so I should probably stop now and let you get on with uh, the few minutes I've allowed you for the rest of your program, but I'm at your disposal. So you're the, you're the boss. It, no, no, actually we're, we're very, very grateful for your generous gift of time and expertise. Uh, you know, I, I'm, uh, I've written in the chat that, um, you know, we certainly uh, have enjoyed uh, having you tonight and uh, hearing all of the, uh, the information that you've shared with us and the opportunity to be able to pose our questions and, and for you to be so thorough in your responses. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Morris. We are grateful for you. Uh, we will be uh, concluding the recording at this time. And uh, if participants are, are willing and interested, 